Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Movie Oubliette, the transcontinental film review podcast with me, Dan, scouring Salvo's stores with my wife to help her find the most 80s attire for a costume-themed karaoke night in Melbourne, Australia. And me, Conrad, scowling at people who wear socks with their sandals in Cambridge, UK. Oh, <laughs> I've actually started doing that. <laughs> really? Oh no. Only, only out of laziness. Oh, no. Well, in this podcast, we discuss fantastical films, sci-fi, horror, and fantasy because we love automatic doors that go shh with faulty electrical wiring and magical objects that we can never find. Ooh. Conrad. How are you today? I'm very well. A little bit shell-shocked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I just went to see the new movie Midsummer. Oh, I've heard so much about this, yes. Yeah, that's an experience. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's unique. I'll give it that. It's certainly a unique vision. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I, I never thought I would ever see some of the things that I saw in that movie. Wow. Yeah, if you go to see that movie, brace yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How about you? I'm sure you've been up to much less shocking things than that. No, just uh, just a whole bunch of dog training at the moment with uh, our new puppy, Baxter. Uh, uh, Baxter. But yeah, he has been occupying our lives in a good way. <laughs> Yeah, they do that for the first uh, first year or so, and then they sort of settle into your groove, which is great. Mm. So, Conrad, how has our Patreon been doing? Well, not too bad. It has to be said, I'm pleasantly surprised and quite proud to report we have six patrons as of recording. Yeah. Really exciting. So, sh- big shout out to Lena, Isaac, Hannah, Gary, Dr. Doggy, and Cold Crash Pictures. Hello, Serge. <laughs> Whoa. Hey, Serge. And thank you, Serge. <laughs> yes, thank you. It's really great of all these people to show their faith in us by becoming patrons. Yay. And getting access to all those exclusive goodies. <laughs> oh, yes. So far, we have the last Starfighter mini episode with Catherine Mary Stewart and Lance Guest and the extended uncut Moobly Awards that we did for the haunting episode, which was way back in episode 10. Mm. But I suppose we ought to make that trip over to the Oubliette and fetch out a movie for us to review this week. Uh, I guess it's my turn. It is. Just a second. Mm. Okay. Oh, Oh, wow. It's just a big mirror. Oh. Oh. (coughs) Something just squirted mountain dew in my mouth. (laughs) Yuck. I guess I'll just reach into this mercury mirror. Yeah. I think I got something. Coming back now. Susan, radiologist, glasses. I am back. Mm, here's a towel for that mountain dew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have with me today the 1987 horror sci-fi film directed by John Carpenter, Prince of Darkness. Ooh. I remember when I first watched this, I expected it to be about vampires and I was uh, ah. completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, it's about many things, but there isn't a vampire in sight. Mm. This film stars Donald Pleasance as Father Loomis, Jameson Parker as Brian, Victor Wong as Professor Howard Burrick, Lisa Blount as Catherine, Dennis Dunn as Walter, Susan Blanchard as Kelly, and the list goes on and on and on because there are far too many (laughs) characters in this movie. Uh, (laughs) The events 
in Prince of Darkness takes place in an old church in the middle of Los Angeles as a collected group of science minds, mostly brilliant undergrads, are forced into taking part in the analysis of a mysterious tube of swirling green ooze with a promise Mm. of extra credit. (laughs) Leading the investigation is a priest and the university professor Howard Burrick as both science and religion breaks down as they discover the ooze is actually Satan, whose intent is to release his father, the anti-god, into the world. What comes next involves white-faced zombies, hordes of bugs, a scabby Satan woman, and mirrors (laughs) that are evidently portals to another world. Mm. Classic John Carpenter, back again with Cosmic Horror. Yes. Ooh, sounds very good. It does. <laughs> and we do have a guest joining us today. Yes. Stay tuned after the break. Okay, listeners, we are back to talk about Prince of Darkness, the 1987 horror sci-fi film directed by John Carpenter. And with us today, we have a very special guest and our very first guest from the realm of podcasts discussing sci-fi and genre films just like us, but for a lot longer than we have (laughs) on his insightful podcast, Sci-Fi On Screen. Hailing from New York City, we are very pleased to welcome Jeff Palermo. Hey! Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Conrad. Really happy to be here with you guys. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And I I believe your podcast has been going for uh, since 2014, is that right? That's right. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I just started it on a whim because I have a really good friend of mine and we go to movies a lot and we do talk about movies a lot, but... I've been watching genre movies for so long and I have so much to say about them that I just thought, what if I could be in a room by myself? I wouldn't bore anybody and uh, yeah. I could talk as long as I wanted to. So I did two or three shows by myself and I, I just came up with a format of going scene by scene, taking my time and just talking about why I liked a certain thing. And, you know, I liked a bit of dialogue here. I liked a bit of cinematography here. Mm. And I recorded two or three shows and listened back to them. And I thought, all right, I like it. Let's see if anybody else likes it. And uh, I just kind of kept going. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm always so, uh, I have so much admiration for people that do it alone as well, because I could never do it alone. <laughs> it can be challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we are talking about Prince of Darkness today. Uh, Jeff, you picked this movie. Uh, could you tell us why you picked it and uh, some initial reactions to the movie? Sure. I think it's very unique in that there's a heavy theme of science that flows through this movie. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there is a supernatural and religious element in the film, which obviously is in many horror movies. But mm. the way it's made it up with physics and ideas about science and how it comes together, I think is so unique and fascinating. The movie as a horror movie, I think at times <laughs> struggles, you know, as you, I'm sure you guys as we'll talk about. But I think the ideas are so strong that even as you're lamenting, ah, oh, not such a great kill, that could have been better. <laughs> Another idea about science and religion and what's going on comes at you where you're just chewing over it and you're thinking that is incredibly fascinating. Um, and the movie just trundles by and there's Alice Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and no one talks about it. Nobody reviews it, even in my horror circles. Nobody knows about it. So it's flown under the radar for so long and uh, I just have such a soft spot for it in my heart. So I wanted to try to see if, first of all, if you guys knew about it and would like to talk about it and then maybe via this podcast, more people will go see it because I I think it's a really unique thing. Mm. Mm, Yeah. Uh, It's it's interesting you mentioned science because there is a film that we've covered uh, a couple of episodes ago called Altered States and that's uh, quite similar in its dealings with science and spirituality and the kind of the blurred lines between it trying to seek the truth but yeah you're right it's never really talked about so this is another example of cosmic horror which i think is a hard genre to pull off in film and i think this is the second of john carpenter's apocalypse trilogy that's right so the thing Mm. this one and also we've covered in the mouth of madness as well and i do think this one's a strong movie yeah it's an interesting one isn't it because it's the first in a four film deal that john carpenter had with alive films 
where he was sort of running from his bad experiences with the studio system because he made a big splash in the late 70s, early 80s and then was picked up for big studio pictures and did things like The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China, Starman, Christine. None of them had done particularly well. Some of them had been treated very badly by the studios in question. So I think John really wanted to have complete creative control. So he entered into this deal to do these three million dollar pictures four of them and this is the first and it kind of feels like a return to his roots in a lot of ways Mm. it's a siege picture very much like assault on precinct 13 and halloween and the thing and donald pleasance is there Mm -hmm. you've got uh, a couple of cast members from big trouble in little china in there as well and it just because it's on a shoestring as well it it feels much more controlled and resourceful and there's a lot of ingenuity being pulled to the fore whereas you know there are some limitations to the budget too which you sort of feel as well as you're watching <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> but it's an interesting entry in his filmography i think yeah i think plot wise and concept wise it's a really complex premise and something that's not easily digestible by most audiences. And I, it's great when John Carpenter has the ability to have that chance to just go all out and not have to dull it down for audiences because often with big studio movies, everything's all dulled down, lots of exposition, lots of explaining and when we can see what's happening. And I do appreciate that. We aren't idiots. <laughs> <laughs> As you say, Jeff, it's got an amazing amount of (laughs) physics in here because John Carpenter, I think, had just swallowed a quantum physics book. That's right. (laughs) Right. He did. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He talks about that. (laughs) And then wrote the screenplay for this movie, albeit under a pseudonym. Martin Quatermass. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Quite a pointed choice of pseudonym, too. There's an interesting story about Nigel Neal as well. Carpenter was a big Nigel Neal fan, and I believe Nigel Neal was hired to write the screenplay to Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. But the director of that film, whose name escapes me at the moment, rewrote it so incredibly much that by the time it was finished, there was little of Nigel's stamp left on it. Uh So he had a bad taste in his mouth. So when he heard that Carpenter had used his name as a pseudonym, instead of being charmed, he was pretty peeved about it. (laughs) Oh, right. (laughs) Yeah, because of course, Quatermass is a direct reference to Neil's creation. Professor Bernard Quatermass? The trilogy that he made, yes. (laughs) That's the one, Yes. yes. So it's Probably a reference to Quatermass and the Pit out of the three from 1967, because the setup is very similar to this. A scientist is called in to investigate an artifact that's been discovered underground. In this case, it's an alien artifact that's discovered in the London underground, and it starts to have an effect on the people around it, and it calls into question all their beliefs on science and religion, and could be apocalyptic in nature. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to this, where we discover that Satan. Satan isn't Satan, he's actually the son of the anti-God, anti-God in the sense that he is to God what antimatter is to matter, and he is a canister of swirling green goo that's been (laughs) discovered underneath a church in, where is it actually? It's in Los Angeles, Hmm. actually. Well, it's outside of Los Angeles, but they state that this Brotherhood of Sleep established this monastery in the 1500s, and I guess the city of LA had grown up around it. I don't know that the Spanish had gotten there that early, but you know, if a secret group of Spanish priests did get there a hundred years earlier, it's still good sci-fi, good horror uh, in terms of a setup, right? Mm, yeah, mm. sure. I love the setting of this movie. Like the church just looks so ominous in the middle of this sprawling city, and you've got this really strange-looking church with these pillars. Mm. Good location scouting. <laughs> yes. Agreed. And very similar to In the Mouth of Madness, of course, with this isolated, striking-looking church that's the wellspring of all doom. <laughs> yes. There are some practicalities to it, though, because the first thing that strikes me after this elderly priest, the last member of the Brotherhood of Sleep, passes away and hands over the key to Donald Pleasance, and Donald goes to investigate and down all of these flights of stairs to find this room with this ancient evil in it. The first thing I 
notices that there are thousands of candles in there. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful scene. Beautiful. <laughs> it is. It's amazing, and especially when it's out of focus, because of course Carpenter is using his favorite anamorphic, anamorphic. lenses. Yeah. Yeah. So it just looks beautiful. But then you think of the practicalities of this very elderly man lighting all of these candles. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Perhaps a coterie of acolytes continue to light the candles regularly to leave the me <laughs> men to just walk down and ruminate, as it were. Yeah, perhaps. I do love it as well when when all the scientists are setting up lights and machines and stuff. They still keep the candles lit, even right, though you've right. got these spotlights as well. <laughs> you got to retain the uh, the spooky atmosphere, the ambiance. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> to hell with fire code. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this building does not look safe. To begin with, <laughs> no, does it really? no, it does not. <laughs> so the tube of goo is Satan, right? And Satan wants to release his father, who is the anti god, from this other realm. Mm. And he does that through mirrors. Yes, yeah. yeah, so the mirrors are the portal to the other side, which is quite interesting. It seems to have been used quite often. I mean, one example that I always think of is Ridley Scott's Legend in 1985. Oh. So a couple of years before this. So I found it quite funny when Kelly was reaching through the mirror and pulling through this big red hand. Mm. I was expecting Tim Curry to come through and start <laughs> oh, <yeah. tackling. laughs> Amazing. Rob Bottin makeup, but uh, no, he was thwarted this time around. But yes, they're trying to bring the anti god into the world to, I don't know, destroy the world. Not entirely sure. Always to create mayhem. You know, <laughs> they always just want mayhem. It's very popular. So <laughs> it is. And at the same time, all of the scientists who have gathered at the request of Donald Pleasance to try to investigate this thing and carbon date it and figure it out, whenever they go to sleep, they are dreaming the same dream. And it appears to be like a fuzzy TV transmission. And they figure out that it's tachyons being fired backwards in time, trying to warn them of what's going to happen. And it's this image of the front of the church with this shadowy figure stood in the doorway. It's an amazing idea. I absolutely love that. Yes. Yeah, I love the idea that if you were able to encode the video signal into tachyons, you would need something, you know, easily procurable, like a map of the universe. But if you had such a thing <laughs> <Yeah>. and you knew <laughs> where the earth was in the universal scheme of things and you would beam this tachyon beam towards the planet, right. I think this is the part that really blew my head off. Mm. It didn't have to go there. Like, this movie would have been fine with it, but I thought, what an incredible idea that was. And mm. it's just, uh, it still strikes me to this day how neat that is. Yeah. Mm. And it's a very freaky image as well. It really disturbed me the first time I watched it. Very haunting. Yes, it is. Yeah, and it's the voice of the director as well that's saying, "This is not a dream. This oh, is not right. a dream." I didn't know that. Oh, good one. <laughs> you can't get much more of an authorial stamp than that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that is true. That is true. <laughs> and I think that the idea. Well, in my mind, I thought whoever comes to this church starts to have the same dreams because the beam is so focused that they're sending back mm. to that place. So whoever stays there for a period of time starts to receive it as well. And I thought. That's just genius. Mm. Well, it's also uh, kind of really interesting as well because of the, the ending, so huge spoilers here, the <laughs> message that is sent, the figure in the doorway turns out to be the character Catherine. Is that her name? It is Catherine. Mm. I don't remember anyone saying her name. Throughout it was the movie. Catherine, yeah. But yeah, so she's the figure in the doorway. So is she the one that is sending this message through time? I don't think so. I think it changes. So initially it's this enormous figure and I think it is supposed to be the anti-god, Satan, whatever it is. Okay. But because Catherine runs and grabs Kelly and pushes her through the surface of the mirror and then Donald Pleasance <laughs> turns out to be a really handy shot with an axe. Very good with an axe. Yeah. Very good. Can't hit Michael Myers for toffee, but very good <laughs> with an axe. Yeah, so he manages to smash the mirror at the last minute and break the link between the two worlds, hmm. trapping Catherine in the other side forever. So the final dream premonition changes and it's her instead. But to be honest, it's not that comforting because she stood there with this blank face with her arms outstretched in a very mm. odd way. Yeah. It doesn't look good to me. I think, yeah, yeah maybe the anti-god has inhabited her 
in some uh, way, or she is the herald, as it were, of the anti-god, mm-hmm. perhaps. Yeah, sure. Well, he certainly was very influential in terms of taking over people, or his son was in any case. Yes. Squirt of Mountain Dew yeah. in the mouth, <laughs> and they all became these sort of satanic zombies. Oh, God. <laughs> mm. I also love, I mean, I guess this is a budget thing, but the squirt is like they just had a water gun of Mountain Dew. It was just like... <laughs> oh, it's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> there might have been someone right behind their mouth, a hose, and it just shot out, and you couldn't see it because of the camera was in front, you know. Yeah, I think he was really running low on funds. Yeah, I feel like it's such a strange disparity between that and then when you go downstairs and you're looking at the swirling cylinder, mm. it looks like a million bucks. It looks like they spent half the production design on the cylinder in the basement. Yes, and uh, when it came to zombie killing action, they ran out. Yeah, yes, it's also really hilarious as well because when they get squirted, it's almost like the actors are just opening their mouths to get as much <laughs> liquid into their mouths as well. Exactly. <laughs> a bit thirsty. If they just close their mouths, maybe uh, yeah. it wouldn't happen. <laughs> Kelly even adjusts because it misses her to begin with. So she sort of adjusts to make sure it goes in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that cylinder looks amazing, which is funny because a lot of Hmm. reviews that I read of this, like uh, Ebert or Leonard Moulton, who gives this movie a bomb rating in his famous movie guide, Mm. they describe it as, oh, this movie reduces Satan to a tub of green goo. And it's like, (laughs) that's really underselling this movie because that prop is incredible. Mm. It looks really odd. And it's not optical. It's entirely Mm. practical on set. That's right. Right. And... I don't know how exactly it's working because the consistency of the thing that's inside it seems to be moving at different rates. It seems to be bioluminescent in a way. It's sort of black and green. And apparently it was quite the prop. It was incredibly heavy. Uh And sometimes if it got itself off balance, like a washing machine with a heavy object in it, it it would start to sort of rattle around. Oh, wow. It could be quite terrifying. So they were scared of it. And it makes sense because it's supposed to be 7 million years old. So it looks it. Mm. Yes, it it really does. Um, So can we talk about the zombie people? Mm. So I was confused because some of them get squirted and they're still alive and they do Satan's bidding. Um, But some of them are dead already and they've been squirted and they come back to life and do Satan's bidding. And also we've got the homeless people as well. Oh, yes. Alice Cooper and his army of homeless people. Ah, Alice. (laughs) I think there's two ways that they're affected. I think the telekinesis energy is affecting the folks around the church. Uh Uh, And I think... It animates them in a certain way, but you're right. In a sense, they seem to be already possessed, and yet the film does make a big play of the green goo mouth squirting. (laughs) So, yeah, I'm kind of confused too. Mm. Yeah, some of them mortally wound themselves and then keep going. Like uh, the gentleman in the neck, <laughs> uh, he was just singing, I believe, Ave Maria, and stabbed himself in the neck with a piece of wood that he ripped off of a, a banister. <laughs> and it was, it was an incredible scene, actually. It's one of the better scenes in that part of the movie. But yeah, he continues on. Yes, mm. he's a freaky guy. Yes. when he continues on as well, because he just continues to just giggle. Yes, for the rest yes. Of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's unsettling. <laughs> yeah, Peter Jason, who plays Dr. Leahy, he dies in the movie and he said to John Carpenter, have you noticed that there are seven people who die and come back as zombies at this movie? And John Carpenter says, oh, no, I hadn't actually. And he says, well, I'm just thinking they could be the seven deadly sins. Ooh, oh, very good. Right. We could each represent them in different ways. Uh-huh. Yeah, He was sort of advocating for that, but then John Carpenter couldn't figure out how to rewrite everything to fit, so they gave up on that idea. Oh, right. right. Roger Ebert pointed out that the film is quite uneven Mm. after such a great setup, especially the first 10 minutes. I love the opening cue from John Carpenter's music. Terrific, terrific. Incredible. And it's amazing storytelling. It's a combination of scenes with dialogue, some scenes without dialogue, where you're just sort of getting a sense of the church trying to figure out what's going on here. And you're introduced to the college characters as well. Victor Wong as Professor Burak, Mm. giving all these mind 
mind-blowing lectures about quantum physics undermining our understanding of reality as we know it. None of that is true. Mm -hmm. He has that great line, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that line. <laughs> He's fantastic in this movie. He is. I like him very much. He's always extraordinarily emphatic, yes. which is why I like him. Yes, he is. He's incredible. Yes, yeah, so it's just a great setup for the first 10 minutes. Really good in terms of mood, economy, and conveying all of these different themes, characters, the basic narrative thrust of what the issue is that we have to deal with. It's my favorite part of the film, I agree. Mm. It's almost too good for itself because at the end of that 10 minutes, you think, oh my God, what am I about to see, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is amazing. This is going to be such a showdown between science and religion. Yeah. And then, as Ebert says, you just get sort of an hour of people running up and down corridors. <laughs> Unfortunately, but that's correct, yeah. Mm. He does do this siege tone very mm. well. I think he's probably the best director of empty corridors that we have <laughs> because it felt very reminiscent of The Thing and mm. Assault from Precinct 13 at times where he creates this sense of uh, an empty place where everyone is gone and the way he shoots it, and it's very uncanny to me, that he tends to create this sense of dread and foreboding mm. with an empty room or a set of empty rooms that is quite startling. Mm. Yeah, he does. And there's amazing widescreen compositions in this movie, as well as it being very much an ensemble movie. I mean, nominally, you have two main characters, which is um, Jameson Parker playing Brian mm -hmm. and Lisa Blount playing Catherine, whose name I think is mentioned once. Yeah. <laughs> I think I had to look her up, yeah. yeah. So nominally, they're the main characters, but they're not given much more screen time than anybody else. It's an ensemble, and Carpenter uses the widescreen frame to film these ensembles talking to each other, looking at things together. But he also uses it in the way that he did in The Fog and The Thing and Halloween. There are these empty spaces behind people that you're just waiting to be filled with something malevolent, something evil. And quite often there are things where the depth of focus is so shallow that somebody will emerge from the out-of-focus background detail to become a threat. And it's, it's really Carpenter at his best visually, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think it is a strange mix of that, the way you've described. And on the other side of it, you have this absurd zombie chase through the closets, which is about <laughs> the most absurd thing I've ever seen. And it's filmed as if he's filming the you know penultimate climax of a superhero movie. Uh, the way it's shot and the music, and they're you know they're climbing through closets. <laughs> I really, I actually really like that. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous, but it, 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 the movie to that point was getting a little dragging, uh, like it dragged a little bit, and so having that big sort of action scene with smashing a hole through a brick wall <laughs> and having to pull Walter out of it. Kelly just being this very scabby, mm. bloody <laughs> Satan figure. The worst makeup. Oh, God. <laughs> it's like, and I love They Live, but you know in, the, in his film They Live when you see the aliens and they're, the, you know, those skull-like features. It kind of reminded me of that. Oh, yeah. But not as good, <laughs> yeah. you know? Although the They Live effects look very much like Halloween masks. They're not very articulate. True, <laughs> very true. I mean, there are a lot of characters in this movie, mm. like a lot. And I was struggling to kind of remember who was who and who was dead and who was still alive and who was a zombie. Right. It was, yeah, a lot going on. I really did love Walter as a character. He was, <laughs> I guess, the comic relief. Yes. But just the arrogant asshole comic relief of the film, but really funny. <laughs> he does achieve quite an amazing trifecta, doesn't he? Because I believe he is sexist, yeah. racist, yeah. and homophobic during the course of the movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I did find it quite amusing given all the homophobic gags that Walter comes out with that he eventually ends up trapped in the closet. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, good one. That's hilarious. Oh, good one, Conrad. Yeah, yeah. He's desperately trying to get out because there are women clawing their way in there. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is too perfect. And Brian's pretty sexist as well if you listen to some of the comments that he comes out with. And a perfect example of one of those, this is my favorite ridiculous moment, is when they're back at school and he and Catherine are having their first conversation and they're talking about physics and then he says hey you know people are wondering what your deal is because you're you know really attractive and you're into science right uh, yeah. and she says that's a really sexist remark and he's offended and he said when you talk physics you open up when you talk people 
you clam up. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it keeps going to the point where she apologizes to him. And I thought, oh, this is horrible. It's like, it's a pre Me Too era where it's like, it was oh, so yeah. horribly sexist. <laughs> and he was such a, with his porn stash, it was so bad. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Brian is dodgy because he's kind of standing outside her dorm room all the time waiting for her to come out. He's such a stalker. Yeah. <laughs> he's so creepy. Yeah. yeah. But then they end up together as well. So I thought, ah, oh, yeah. Catherine, come on. <laughs> Her standards are way too low, yeah. Yeah, it really plays into that whole narrative that men were taught throughout sort of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and God, it was dying in the 80s, but it's still here, unfortunately, that persistence is key. Yes. That if you just keep stalking women and asking them over <laughs> oh, and over God. and over again, and even oh. stand outside their bedroom window with a boombox, eventually they will <laughs> give in. <laughs> And yet you reverse that narrative and have a woman phoning up all the time and all of a sudden she's the bunny boiling psychopath. <laughs> that it's a horror movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's true. If there's no male fatal attraction where it's flipped, right? Yeah. No, not at all. It's amazing the lack of self-consciousness. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, it's very true. And the further down now that we get as things are wonderfully changing in the past couple of decades, you're really coming around. It's, you know, you go back to some of your favorite films and you're like, ah, oh, that's a shame, you know? <laughs> Like, yeah. There are these little exactly. moments that are passed <laughs> off as admirable moments on the part of the male protagonist where you're just like, oh, that's too bad, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure in the case of Prince of Darkness that John Carpenter didn't have any of this in mind when he was writing it. Right, right, right. Since he did write all of the other dialogue. Yeah, yes. he is responsible. So mm. it's quite interesting in terms of an insight into John Carpenter's mind. And yet he's not very forthcoming on commentary tracks. You press him on anything like thematics or even plot details these days and he just shakes his head and says, oh, I don't know. Looked fun. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he is the anti-auteur, as mm -hmm. I like to call him. You can start a conversation by saying the composition in this, blah, blah, blah. And he'll, he's like a bricklayer. He'd just be like, I don't know. One camera was broken, so we had to use the other one. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes it's to the point where you're like, you got to be putting me on. Like, no one's that anti-artistic, right? But he, yeah. I don't know, it's his thing, right? Yeah, very much so. And it's kind of frustrating that he doesn't recognize his own brilliance, but maybe it's great in a way that he doesn't because one of the things he's struck by when he looks back at this movie is how controlled it is and how purposeful every single shot is. Mm -hmm. That's why I would put forward an argument that a lot of people say They Live is his last great movie or In the Mouth of Madness is his last great movie. I think it's this. Mm -hmm. I think it's The Prince of darkness mm. largely because he didn't have the resources to go as batshit crazy as he did later on and he had to be economical and resourceful and control every single shot and make sure that it conveyed what it needed to convey because he didn't have time to fart around mm. I guess. yeah i think you're right on about that sometimes i my friend and i always have these discussions about whether throwing lots of money and freedom at an artist is a good thing or a bad thing because sometimes you see extraordinarily self-indulgent films from talented people that are given lots of time and freedom. And sometimes the constraints of the industry can often produce something beautiful and brilliant mm. as well. Mm. So That's true. That's very yeah. true. Because, uh, yeah, I, I think restraint is key. I kind of have a similar opinion to, like, the Beatles. So, like, Paul McCartney, when he doesn't have restraint and friction with John Lennon, he writes music that I don't want to listen to because <laughs> it's just too cheesy. He needs someone to hold him back a little bit. And I think having restraints on a director holding them back just a little bit prevents something too crazy and out there that no one will understand. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right on about that. Yeah, there are quite a few promising auteurs that their sophomore effort just, yeah, you're quite surprised at how crazy it is and how unsatisfying satisfying it is you look at something like Donnie Darko to Southland Tales that came right to my mind I was just about to mention Southland Tales that's great yeah, yeah and poor Richard Kelly ended up doing the box and then yeah. it was all over that was oh, that, sad, that movie it? no yeah. right that was something that was something oh. <laughs> I wanted to ask, so some of these zombie people were killing other people, I guess to recruit them as like dead zombies, is that is that what was happening? And also the homeless people preventing anyone escaping because <laughs> Satan needed zombie helpers, is that, is that what was going on? I think that's accurate. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I think it's also to create that siege as well. It's quite a scary situation they suddenly find themselves in because you have like an hour of the movie where it's all this scientific investigation and most of them think that it's bullshit and they're thinking about leaving. And then Frank Wyndham goes outside and stands in the car park and says, hey, I'm going home. This is all bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And something very unpleasant happens to him. Oh, I love that. That's a good death. <laughs> it's pretty creepy. The, uh, I believe he becomes filled with beetles. Yeah. And to the point where you realize that the filter on his voice is that there are beetles in his larynx of some kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he, his last lines are, pray for death, and his head just pops <laughs> off along with his hands and arms and everything else. It's death by beetle. I think I thought it was really yeah. brilliant. And even yeah. before that, he's stabbed to death by a bag lady, and there's this fantastic, oh, right. fantastic shot of, I think it's like a, a scissor blade. It's like half of a pair of scissors, yes. and it's being held aloft and the background is sort of flying past and it's a very unnatural sort of Dario Argento type of shot. Oh uh, yeah it is. It's just like a, a wall painted on the side of a truck and the truck was just driving by whilst the bag lady just stood there. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah it's a startling scene it's a great kill. Mm -hmm. Yeah although there is the bicycle impalement gag. <laughs> Which actually was uh, an Alice Cooper stage prop that he mm. used to use in his rock shows. Oh, right. <laughs> um, and he showed it to Carpenter, and Carpenter said, oh, we got to put this in the movie. So Cooper would fake impale himself on the bike on stage, and they did it in the movie. I think it's one of the better deaths, and it reminded me a little bit of uh, the death in Halloween of when Michael's in the kitchen. The girl and the boy had just had sex, and the, the boy comes downstairs to get some food. And he holds him up and then stabs him on the wall and leaves him there. And there's that mm. moment where Michael cocks his head. And we wait a minute. <laughs> and it happened here in the bicycle kill. Mm. The zombies move back. The Alice Cooper character moves back. And he stands semi-upright on the bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> and Carpenter gives it a moment on the screen. And it's very creepy and uncanny. And I'm Ugh. sure Cooper must have done it live, which would have been cool. But it was the best death. I didn't, other than the Beetle Man, I think that was the coolest <laughs> death. Yeah, I think it's Tom Bray, Etchison. Yes. He's kind of the nerdy computer character, which is also the same role that he played in Riptide for several years, I believe, on television. Oh, wow. <laughs> Good bit <laughs> yeah. of trivia there. <laughs> yeah. Riptide. <laughs> oh, just you wait until I get on to Simon and Simon with Jameson Parker. <laughs> oh, that's who that was. Oh, I never, okay. Yeah. I didn't put that together. Good one. Yeah, lots of TV people in this movie all being killed off and not often in very elaborate or exciting ways yeah and eventually as you said dan you sort of lose track of who's alive and who's dead and who's missing yeah but i think the movie itself even makes fun of that i love the fact there's this recurring gag where everybody's asking who susan is yeah <laughs> susan radiologist glasses it's the same right, line right, three right. times in a row somebody different and they all describe her as susan radiologist glasses oh that's classic <laughs> it's very funny it's, it's not a humorless movie i don't think no 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 it does have humor for sure oh no there's a great uh, moment with one of my favorite lines is this the old woman who speaks this to Donald Pleasance's character. What is his character's name again? <laughs> well, if you look it up, it's Father Loomis. Oh, you're kidding. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's never mentioned in the movie. Because I don't, yeah, I feel like we never hear his name. It's just Father. <laughs> yeah. No, it's never mentioned in the movie. Ah, but if you look at the credits, it's Loomis. Nice. <laughs> just, <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Johnny boy. So the quote goes, it's wonderful what you're doing with the church, Father. And she has an odd filter on her voice and she looks very creepy. And he looks down and sees maggots in her coffee cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But her, you know, her macabre statement is very good, you know? Yeah. Mm, very yeah. foreboding. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, I mean, this movie does the thing that I always mention with horror. It just bugs. Mm. Lots of bugs everywhere right Wild the bugs. insects yes <laughs> even worms on windows yeah that's right <laughs> how did they do that <laughs> yeah if your budget's tight bring out the bugs yeah <laughs> <laughs> easy way to creep people out it is <laughs> i guess we could talk about score because this is another john carpenter score is that right i believe it's a it's one of his in association with alan haworth scores oh, right. yes that's right it's one of several that he did in association with alan house one of the last and i think the best 
best. I, I don't know. It's difficult. It's very good. I prefer his scores from the 80s, the late 70s and the 80s, where the synths are analog synths. They sound like synths. They're creating otherworldly textures. Mm-hmm. Yes. Rather than when he starts getting into MIDI samples of orchestras, he does have samples in this and it's all choir sounds mm-hmm. and it does amazing things with them yes. because he's not making them sound natural at all. It's unnatural, it's ethereal, and there's these huge stacks of voices crying out over these end-of-times moments in the movie. And it does sort of overplay the movie somehow. Like you say, people sort of running around in closets and there's this big choir screaming (laughs) away. But I think it's responsible, I think, for sort of at least half of the atmosphere of this movie. Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes up with budget by having a decent score. No, it's very true. And I think I also am a fan of his earlier soundtracks. I think in the 90s, he started to use some rock mm. elements and he was using drums and electric guitars and vampires. And <laughs> But uh, yep. yeah, it's something that I think his films, uh, I just did a podcast on the, the latest Halloween mm. uh, sequel, which I was not a fan of. And one of my criticisms of it is there is so much silence in that film mm. and it needs music desperately. And it really made me appreciate how Carpenter can use sound to take what might be a pedestrian or fairly okay scene and make it creepy or haunting. Uh, The one I recall from Halloween when Laurie and her two friends are walking in the neighborhood and Michael is lurking and there's just this little synth patch that's playing in the background and it's incredibly foreboding. Mm. There's a similar scene in the latest Halloween film when they're walking in the neighborhood and Michael hadn't broken out yet, so we know he's not there, and there's no music. So you're getting a little homage in terms of a widescreen uh, set shot, which is you know very beautiful, but there's no menace or dread to it whatsoever. And mm. so I think that, yeah, he really can do a lot with music to make up for perhaps you know what he's lacking in, in budget for certain mm. things. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he always tells that story of how he showed Halloween without a score to a group of executives or studio people or whatever, and they just thought, what is this? This is the lamest movie ever. Uh And then he went away, recorded the score and came back and people were terrified by it. Music has a great deal of power. And I think his stripped down, simple, minimalist, repetitive, eerie music is fantastic. And it's still very much the same here. It's not thematically complex. There's kind of one theme that's repeating. There's a little bit of a motif for the fledgling love between Brian and Catherine, but it's not that complex. It's more mood setting. Mm, Yeah. There were some moments in the movie, Conrad, you've said it before, where it does sound like he's just leaning on a keyboard and it's just a big cluster <laughs> cluster of notes just ringing out. I believe that's when his dog knocked him into the keyboard. Uh, oh, yes. If, if he was being interviewed, that was probably what he would say. Oh, my, my wife pushed me into the piano, so I left it in. <laughs> now it's time for Random Trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating trivia about Prince of Darkness has squirted out of the canister and into your mouth? (laughs) Indeed. Well, the piece of trivia I have today is in the scene where the guy gets killed by Alice Cooper's character with the bicycle pole. Mm. And uh, the guy is actually listening to headphones while he's being uh, murdered. And... The song that he's actually listening to is a song called Prince of Darkness by Alice Cooper himself. Oh. So he's listening to Alice Cooper while being killed by Alice Cooper. (laughs) (laughs) In Prince of Darkness while he sings about Prince of Darkness. Yeah. (laughs) Did he write the song for the movie? Because that's a hell of a coincidence otherwise. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I'll need to find (laughs) that out. But if listeners out there know that, please tell us. (laughs) Yes, please do. (laughs) And that's our trivia. Yeah. Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Moobly Awards. Okay, listeners, welcome to your favourite existential segment of the pod, the Moobly Awards, where we present our favourite things of the film in the number of spiritually apocalyptic categories. Best quote. Well, mine, despite the rampant homophobia, I did find Walter quite entertaining, and I did like the moment where he's talking to Kelly, 
and she has this bruise on her arm that just keeps getting bigger and bigger as the movie progresses until she's possessed. He says it's probably nerves, and she says, you don't bruise from nerves, Walter. And he replies, I used to break out all the time when I was 12. Doctor said it was homosexual panic. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Go, Walter. Oh, Walter. I think uh, he pulls it off because he's Asian, though. (laughs) Because if it was a white guy... He's got a card to play. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to ask you, though, Dan, what is this thing where he says to the other Asian member of the cast, has anyone ever told you that you could pass for Asian? Yeah. What the hell is that? That's a really funny line, too. And I also never... I kind of laughed at it without really understanding it. Yeah, (laughs) I think think it's the sort of cliche that Asian women are a little bit more sort of frigid and reserved uh, and that's kind of how she is towards him and so yeah it's another line where he could only pull it off because he's Asian as well yeah yeah (laughs) best hair or costume clothing wise I was pretty impressed with Catherine's puffy green blouse that she even had the audacity to tie in a knot ah, yes. <laughs> in front. <laughs> Which I thought, that's a pretty good 80s move. <laughs> yeah, pretty much all the characters were just the epitome of 80s. Uh, I just think of Walter and he's got a button up shirt <laughs> and he's rolled the sleeves up way past his elbow <laughs> and his, his shirt's tucked into it, to the dress pants and the belt. Mm. But all the items of clothing are like at least two sides is too big as well. It's just hanging off him. <laughs> I did notice that. But yeah, yeah, just a very 80s moment. Everything is really poofy, isn't it? There must have been so much material to spare oh, in those days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or they didn't want to rip any costumes by having things fit too well since the budget was so tight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah you just got to wear what you're given. <laughs> the Captain Kirk effect. Yeah. Most 80s moment. I think my most 80s moment was... The porn stash. It really oh, was yes. something to behold. Yeah. <laughs> it was just uncanny and spectacular. Yeah. Jameson Parker's porn stash. It's 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 really <laughs> fulsome. Oh yeah. And it's and it's down the sides of the mouth a little bit, and it's perfect, even though it's like two days throughout the whole movie, and it's it's perfect the whole time. I mean, technically you could say that's a perfect 70s moment, but I think you could squeeze it into the 80s, the early 80s. <laughs> oh, for sure. I, I just think of Tom Selleck. Yes, right. Good yes. call. Good call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's definitely that. That was actually my vote as well, so Dan, you go for it. Oh, good. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the 80s moment, I mean, obviously the computers just look only from the 80s. <laughs> oh, good call. But also there is one scene where uh, Father Loomis is using an electric typewriter, which I don't think anyone ever used apart from the 80s, maybe. <laughs> that was, that's very astute. <laughs> mm. yeah. IBM Selectric, as it were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> favorite scene. Well, I would have to say favorite sequence, and I'm um, Conrad mentioned it earlier, but that opening nine minutes is about yeah. the most perfect intro. I mean, what are you getting in nine minutes of film besides the eerie music? Is you're getting these concepts of the Brotherhood of Sleep, information about a 1500 Spanish mission. You're seeing the journal and the key. Um, you're seeing the insect behavior, the strange optical effect outside. You're seeing the juxtaposition of physicists and clergy, Mm -hmm. priests asking scientists for help, cutting back and forth, and you're given so much setup and information. Something is approaching, something is coming, Mm. and you're breathless. And then after the nine minutes, you go into credits, and I think you go into Prince of Darkness. And that to me is, as Conrad had mentioned earlier, what you get in that time is how economical and essential it is is just really wonderful sometimes i can go back and just watch the intro because you get to hear the full (laughs) nine minute music cue just opening this mystery box halfway and this wonderful thing being apparent inside so i'm just so thrilled with it Mm. Mm I also love how that opening sequence is is mainly no dialogue as well Mm. so it's it's great visual storytelling which i love and (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, it's a great sequence. How about you, Conrad? What's your favorite? I think it's probably the finale. I think it's a great example, textbook example of Carpenter creating climaxes out of intercutting between several different strands of things happening at the same time. Mm. And it all coming to this point of Catherine having to make this terrible decision of helping 
Brian, who's being attacked by the Calder zombie, who's giggling still, probably, yeah. and <laughs> stopping <laughs> stopping Kelly from pulling the Lord of Darkness into the world, and finally running and knocking her in, and Donald Pleasance being a dead shot with an axe, and it all coming to an end. But I think it's just that one shot, that shot of Catherine through the mirror, it's an underwater shot, it's sideways, she's reaching up in desperation to try and get back, and the light goes out. She's sort of frozen, it's like a tableau, and it's a ghostly, eerie, disturbing image, and it's always stuck with me, that shot. And apparently the actress Lisa Blount was terrified because they filmed it in a swimming pool, it was lit from below, it was tented in so you couldn't see the surface when the lights went out. So she's underwater wow. being filmed and then they turn the wow. lights out and now she can't see anything. She did not enjoy it. Wow. <laughs> I was wondering how they, they filmed it as well. It's a very haunting image. It is. Most cliche horror moment. Initially, I was going to say bugs because you've got to have bugs in horror. But also that very last scene when Brian has had the, the dream again and seen Catherine in his dream, and then he wakes up, and then there's <laughs> yeah. that bloody jump scare thing that all horror directors do, we, where a character wakes up, turns to the <laughs> right or left, and it's just something scary, loud noise. It's the scabby Kelly character, and, and then he wakes up again, and it was, oh, I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although it has to be said, that final shot where he reaches out to the mirror to oh. see whether there is a portal there and it cuts to black and the titles come up, the second before his fingers touch the surface is incredible. Mm, yeah, great cliffhanger there. I always do a little applause when that happens. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> Jeff, what was your most cliche horror or sci-fi moment? You know, I don't know that it was a moment, but I think most of the zombie kills in the second act were really terrible. A lot of them were neck break. <laughs> there was some neck breaking, I think, at some point, yes. Um, yes. or choking. Yeah. And they just thought, was like, really? <laughs> You're hitting me with all these <laughs> mind expanding concepts, and I'm getting a neck break? Like, come on, guys. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. terrible. So yeah. it was really, it was a little easy way out, some of the deaths that happen um, in the second act. Mm. Yeah. I always think of a, of a neck break kill as the lowest budget kill that you can get out of a movie. That's right. <laughs> Just need a sound effect in there, you're done. <laughs> you need a stick of celery and you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and an actor that doesn't mind getting whiplash. That's it. <laughs> Pretty much. That's right. That's right. Best special effect. My favorite special effect probably has to be the cylinder. Um, right. I do yes, love I, I do love her pulling the hand out at the end, but it it looks like kind of a red lo it looks like a lobster at some point. So it does. <laughs> I was back and forth about like oh, I love the hand, but I think I love the idea of the hand more than the actual hand. If I go back and really look mm -hmm. at it, but yeah. that cylinder is just it's a centerpiece of the movie. So uh, it's my my favorite effect. I think it's a subtle effect because it's not moving. Although obviously the liquid is moving, but the rust on the bottom and the top and it just made it look like this incredibly ancient thing that it was. So uh, I just mm. every time we looked at it, and they lit it perfectly. So it was my favorite special effect, I think. Mm. I 100% agree with that. I mean, in terms of the hands coming out, there's a good reason for that. They're completely fake hands on both counts. And it's because the surface of the mirror was achieved through the use of mercury. Ah, <laughs> uh, which is toxic. Yeah. <laughs> which is highly toxic. And so nobody could touch it. So it's entirely fake hands moving in and out of that wow. thing. Oh. And they cheated because, you know, they're on such a shoestring budget, they actually drained the mercury out of the camera dolly. It's a counterweight. I'm sure oh they don't God. use it as a counterweight it's, now. <laughs> that is so but Carpenter. It, <laughs> so the 80s as well. <laughs> this toxic material. Yeah, right. Just don't but, yeah. breathe in for 20 minutes. We'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So they drained it out of there, put it into a, a tank and then filmed all of those sequences and then poured it back in and hoped that the rental company didn't notice. <laughs> That's a great bit of trivia. Favorite sound you Fact. My favorite sound effect is actually the neck breaks that you were talking about earlier, Jeff. There is one <laughs> where 
I don't think it's a stick of celery. It sounds like dentures being ground together in a glass jar or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, wow, that's a good it's, image right there. Yeah, it's one of the guys with a mullet, but I, I, I get confused as to which mullet dies first. But <laughs> yeah, he gets his neck broken. His neck's not in great shape. It's really grinding. <laughs> I totally missed that. I'll have to go back and try to find that one. <laughs> Jeff, did you have a favorite sound? My favorite sound was the audio recording from the future. I really liked oh, how they, yeah. they did some limiting and I felt like uh -huh. it was just a wonderful effect of hearing these voices and it's staticky and it's coming in and I, I don't know, I thought they did a great job with it. I, I totally bought it as what the movie wanted me to buy it as. Yeah. I, I think that that recording has been sampled in, in music as well. So it's, oh, I think yeah. it's been in a Marilyn Manson song and a DJ Shadow song as well. So I don't doubt it. <laughs> it's made its mark. Yeah. Uh, I also laugh at, the, at those dream sequences as well because it's, you know, it's a message from the future, but the future still uses analog. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm reminded of a, there's a Bruce Willis movie called Surrogates where they use USB ports in it. And it's like, wow, uh, it's, in 10 years time, everyone's going to be laughing at that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It's like uh, strange days where they're storing people's memories on Sony mini discs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most funniest <laughs> moment. Well, my favorite was uh, Lisa who's transcribing the evil bible from downstairs the, mm -hmm. the journal uh, so she's typing a lot but after she's possessed one of the characters discovers her typing <laughs> in her bewitched zombified state and he looks at the screen she starts aggressively threatening him but in type form <laughs> so it's like you will not be saved by the holy ghost you will not be saved by the god plutonium in fact all caps. You will not be saved! <laughs> Exclamation marks. <laughs> oh, God. And it's just the combination of the all caps shouting and the furious typing sounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lisa's aggressive typing. That's a good one. I can imagine if it was a modern computer, it would be followed by, you know, an angry emoji, you know, a devil <laughs> emoji. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Definitely. My funniest scene, it's really, it, it was unintentionally funny, uh, but it's it's when the professor and the priest are entering into the basement for the first time. They walk down the stairs and it's really gloomy and dark and spooky and there are candles, thousands of candles lit everywhere and they approach a book and the professor just says, Latin? Yeah, no, <laughs> no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what else would it be, I guess? It's, it's almost, it's the equivalent of walking into a dining room and pointing to the dining room table and going, table. <laughs> Victor Wong is so great in this movie. He's so good with physics speeches. And a can of Sprite as well. <laughs> yeah, if true. you'll remember. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most absurd moments in this otherwise cool movie. <laughs> I cannot get over that scene. I, I, does he try to light it on fire or does he just throw it at this? It's like he has nothing else, no weapon of any kind. So he just, the can of Sprite is shaken and I think fizzed in the face of the zombie. Yeah. yeah. I think the nadir of the film for me right there. I thought, oh, John, what happened that day? You know, it's, you know, what, why? Why did you do that? It, was, it belonged in like Shaun of the Dead, you know? Yeah. 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 And that's our Moobly Awards. Yeah. <laughs> All right, listeners, we are back for the final verdict. Should Prince of Darkness be freed from the swirling tube to frolic with Alice Cooper and his homicidal homeless buddies, or should it be pushed through the mercury mirror and lost into the oubliette void, never to be seen again? <laughs> Jeff, you are our guest today. <laughs> what were your final thoughts about Prince of Darkness? Final thoughts is I think it should be resurrected. I think it should be pulled out. Uh, it has its problems, but I don't know that I've seen a horror film with the density of ideas in the story itself that is that thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. The bit of a backstory, which we didn't get to, but the idea that the battle between good and evil took place seven million years ago, but Christ came later to warn everybody about 
these beings mm -hmm. in order to shut him up. He was killed, right? And then mm. this other idea that the decision was made by Christianity to characterize evil as a spiritual force rather than a physical one was another idea. And, and you know, it made me want to pause the movie to just think, where has that idea ever been even played with? That mm. the idea here was that Christianity said, no, okay, we know evil's a... And even Father Loomis says it was a lie, you know, in his wonderful Donald Pleasance overacting. <laughs> it was a lie. We were lied to, you know. But that, that's, that idea is that it was characterized as uh, spiritual. And the scientists are back in to prove that it is absolutely not. And it has to do with the subatomic realm. I think so much of that is so great. Mm. It is a shame. And it's why it kind of belongs on the rim. Maybe not all the way out, but not in. Because <laughs> the execution of the actual, the tactile externalization of that idea is quite poor in many areas. Mm. You know, the zombies just, and the makeup and the money that they had, it really just didn't come off as... A, to me, a good horror movie, you know, and I think of a good horror movie, like very suspenseful. This was very cut up into, here's a creepy scene, here's a cool idea, here's a creepy scene, there's a zombie kill. I think Carp, in a weird way, was at his lowest in the horror movie craft. Uh, he was high, I think, in his overall film craft, as Conrad had mentioned earlier. Mm. But I, I still think there's more in it than 10 average horror movies that I think it should be out there a little bit more in the culture and talked about. And some of these ideas maybe talked over and brought out because I think it is so wonderfully dense with this, all these ideas that Carp had. So, uh, so I vote, you know, get it out into the light. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree with you. And I also think it's somewhat of a return to form for John Carpenter after a lot of big budget movies that were recognized as ahead of their time and amazing after the fact, like The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China, but also things that, are, although they're interesting in a lot of ways, like Christine, they're not actually great movies. And then you get this, which is low budget, back to basics, siege movie, lots of characters, lots of ideas, lots of stripped back, lean shots, lots of suspense, and a permeated with this sense of dread that only Carpenter at his finest could produce. I think it's really fantastic filmmaking. It is a little bit disappointing in the middle. It sort of sags. It doesn't quite live up to the grand ideas that it sets out at the beginning, but I think it rallies for the end. I think the ending is really very exciting and some of those final images are really haunting, probably among Carpenter's best, I would say. And as you say, Jeff, it's just not talked about as much as his other films. It's not even talked about as much as They Live, which uh, was the other film he made with the live films. I actually think it's a better movie than They Live. So I think it should be out there. I think people should be watching it more. And yes, go Prince of Darkness. I would release him from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything you two have said, 100% agree. I, I think as well, with modern horror being very formulaic and very almost templated, this movie is not like that at all. It, it does its own thing. Mm. It has far too many characters as it should have, but that's a it's a good thing. Like, <laughs> and there were really interesting characters. They weren't too cliche. I love the ending, and I know Jeff, you've said that the effects weren't great, but I really like the effects of the <laughs> sort of scabby Satan uh, and the uh, the lobster hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I have a, a soft spot for kind of not great special effects, but if there's the intent there and there's great mm. writing, uh, great characterization, I think that's what pulls it through. Conrad, I think I messaged you when I first watched this over a year ago, before we even started the podcast, mm. um, just wanting to discuss it because there's so much to discuss and break down in the film. And it's something that you just think about afterwards for days <laughs> yeah definitely definitely yeah it stays with you and it's one of his films that i go back to often and i was so thrilled in this country they released a 4k edition of the movie recently it's just amazing to me that you know star wars isn't available in 4k but you can get prince of darkness i think that's <laughs> great oh wow <laughs> so uh, we are releasing the film we are go free prince of darkness <laughs> <laughs> So I guess it's time to reveal the film we're doing next episode, Conrad. Mm, yes, well, we're in remake territory again. It's the 1988 remake of the 1958 horror classic... 
The Blob. It's a film I have never actually watched, even though everyone talks about it. Yeah, it's this fascinating one. So it's co-written by none other than Frank Darabont of the Shawshank Redemption fame oh. and Chuck Russell, the director of Nightmare on Elm Street 3, who is also directing this remake. And it stars Kevin Dillon, Shawnee Smith, Donovan Leach, Jeffrey DeMunn, Candy Clark and Joe Seneca. Ah, great. Can't wait. Yeah, cheesy 80s remake. I'm up for that. Especially with fluids. <laughs> yes. The more <laughs> fluids, the better. We like corrupting fluids. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of which, it's been lovely having you here with us, Jeff, to discuss the corrupting fluids of Prince of Darkness. I'm sure all of our listeners have enjoyed hearing your insightful thoughts into this movie. And of course, they could hear more of your insights if they followed your podcast. Yes, um, my podcast is called Sci-Fi On Screen, and you can find it on pretty much every format available. I just put it up on Spotify. Mm. It's on Apple Podcasts. So wherever podcasts are available, you can find it. And I tend to do uh, shows that last about an hour. I usually do one film at a time. Sometimes I'll do uh, original versus remake. Uh, there are times when I'll do a show called Short Takes where I'll just talk about movies that I don't want to do a long take on that I've seen recently. So I try to vary it a little bit, but very easy to find. Yeah, and they're well worth listening to. I, I really enjoyed your episodes on Halloween, which you talked about, and also Solo, because you managed to explain why exactly I was so unsatisfied with that movie. Oh, and I glad. couldn't put my finger on it. You just said every other character in that movie is more interesting than Han Solo. And I thought, <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. I listened to uh, uh, your episode on Upgrade because no one seems to be talking about that movie and it was really great mm. to hear someone talk about it. Oh, another one. <laughs> I know. Mm. It's such a good movie. Yeah. And if you want to follow Movie Oubliette, we are on all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you want to email us, we're movie.oubliette at gmail.com. And please, of course, give us a rating and review if you haven't already. Share us to your friends and family. And don't forget you can patronise us on <laughs> Patreon and gain access to all sorts of exclusive goodies. It sounds wrong, but it's a good thing. <laughs> it is. really is. We love being patronised. <laughs> patronise us all you like. <laughs> so, thanks again, Jeff, for being with us. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me on the show. I really appreciate being here and I really had a lot of fun. Until next time. Bye for now. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Tend to forget. Come with us and don't the movie you be yet. This is not a dream.